Um, so in terms of the agenda, we're going to do an introductory presentation. That just gives a little bit of background information on the cloud APIs, sort of some things that are useful to know before we launch into the development exercise. Uh, we'll all sign up for the developer portal. So those of you who are not yet on the wireless, that's another thing to do just in the background. Um, there's an Alfresco DevCon or Alf DevCon wireless that you should be able to sign up to, no password. And fingers crossed, it holds out for the conference. Um, we had a few issues in Berlin. Uh, we'll then go into a coding exercise for about an hour, and Gethin will actually be leading that. I'm going to be floating around the audience and helping out you know, anybody who has questions. Very interactive. We don't want this to be just us standing here and lecturing. So feel free to ask questions. You know, uh, you know, raise your hands if you've if you've got questions during the presentation or during the coding, and we'll come and help you out. Uh, we'll then spend just a little bit of time at the end on where to get help, the future direction for our APIs, uh, and also Q and A, just as time permits. Um, and of course, you know, Gethin and I will be at the conference all week. You've please feel free to come up and talk to us about, uh, you know, with any questions that we don't cover or don't get to today. So as I mentioned, one question already. This is a single session. So yeah, if you have a look at that schedule, you'll notice it's longer than one session. What we're doing is we're using both sessions combined as a single session. So although it's written up in the agenda as part one, part two, it's actually a one part session that is twice as long. And that's just because coding is necessarily a fairly slow exercise, so we needed the extra time. Um, and I'll get to some logistics in a minute. Those of you who are thinking and wondering whether you can sit here for an hour and a half, we'll, I'll get to that. So really the goal, the thing I want all of you to leave the room with, if possible, is a functioning cloud app. I would all love for you to have an application on your laptop that you can go away and in a month's time when you've decompressed, when you've caught up on your inbox, you can basically go to the location that you have this example run it again and start to remember and recall some of the things we've talked about today and extend and build on it. So the goal is very much to have a functioning cloud app. Uh, we're going to do a short introductory presentation, as I mentioned, followed by lengthy coding. And because we're running this as a single session, um, please feel free to get up, head out if you need to have a break, if you want to get coffee, need a bathroom break, whatever it is, just feel free to do it. Don't, you don't need to raise your hand, you don't need to ask permission. Uh, most of the time we're going to be heads down coding anyway, so you know, please don't be shy about getting up and, and, and leaving as needed. The other thing is to try not to tax the Wi-Fi. We have like a pre-built starting point or a template app that we're going to be revising through the session. Um, that's fairly large, so we've been passing around USB keys. Those of you who've seen the key, please copy, I think there's three or four zip files on there and maybe a readme, I'm, I'm, I'm going a little off memory. Copy those into a, a new directory or a directory on your hard drive and then just pass the key on. And that will just save us from taxing the Wi-Fi with large downloads because we want to keep the Wi-Fi for hitting the cloud. So let's launch in. And pl please feel free to pass that key around as, as we go. Question? It's already available online, actually on the site. Um, again, we're trying not to tax the Wi-Fi because the Wi-Fi was very brittle in Germany and we learnt our lessons, so the keys are a better way for us to give you the bits as much as we can. But these assets are all available on the, the uh, presentation site as well, on the DevCon site. A JVM. Yep, that's it. And we did list that in the description, but I realise it's probably you know it's in the fine print. So as long as you have a one six or one, or newer JVM, you should be good to go. Everything else is everything else you need is actually in the zip file that will that's on the key. Okay, so let's launch in, uh, try to get to the coding bit. So first up, the Alfresco API. What is it? What does it do? Really, the Alfresco API is a set of remotely invoked APIs that allow you to interact with the Alfresco cloud, and soon Alfresco on-premise as well, the Enterprise and Community Editions. Um, but initially, we've released this in cloud um, because right now there is an API for the on-premise product. Things like CMIS already exist in the on-premise product we needed to offer something equivalent to that in cloud. And indeed, that's what we launched at Java 1. What it's comprised of is two pieces. There is a CMIS piece, and it is the Atom Pub binding only. Those of you who are familiar, actually, let me get a, raise, a show of hands. Who here has used or is familiar with CMIS? So maybe half-ish. So those of you who are familiar with CMIS will know it offers a number of bindings. In the in initial version, there were two. 
SOAP and Atom Pub XML. We're only offering one of those bindings initially in cloud, and that's the Atom Pub binding. For the most part, this is pretty much irrelevant. If you're using one of the client libraries, you don't even know which one. You can pick and switch between them without you know your code really being affected. Um, but it is just a good point to note. We've had a couple of partners who use the SOAP binding and are somehow coupled to the SOAP binding, and they've been unable to use our cloud yet. Um, so just, just to be totally clear and in the interest of full disclosure. We also have a REST component, and this is where we've been investing most of the new work on the APIs. This is a JSON-based REST API, or series of REST APIs, and these augment the, the, what CMIS can do with Alfresco-specific notions. So CMIS gives you all of the basic kind of CRUD, file, folder, metadata, version, history stuff, um, the core file management bit of content management. What it doesn't do is cover things like activity streams, networks, in fact I think I have a slide that shows this, um, sites, uh, people, users, membership, those sorts of things are not concepts that CMIS covers yet. So what we've done is we've augmented CMIS with these REST APIs that expose those alfresco um, concepts. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, before I move on actually, and it's interesting to note that these APIs are usable from really anywhere, desktop apps, web apps, mobile apps. We expect most of the growth to be with mobile apps and web apps. Um, but if you're doing a, I don't know, a .NET Windows native app, you can also use these APIs. Really all they need is an HTTP client of some kind and you're good to go. Um, and that's one of the advantages of having a remotable API is we don't have to dictate to you to use Java or any particular technology. There's also a mobile SDK piece here and there's separate talks. In fact, Gav's sitting up the back. Gav, do you want to just want to put your hand up for a second? Just put your hand up for a sec. So Gav is a leader of our mobile uh, engineering team. There are some talks later in the conference around the mobile SDKs. So if you're interested in that particular piece, I'd encourage you to go to those talks. We're not going to really cover that today. We're just going to be doing, uh, in fact, we're going to be doing a web app today. So moving along, um, the first thing that's different about this compared to Alfresco's existing API story is that we're using an authentication standard called OAuth2 to protect these APIs. So those of you who've used the on-premise product will know that we support NTLM, NTLM HTTP basic auth, and then single sign-on, various forms of single sign-on. With the cloud, we're not offering any of those. None of those are available to you. What is available instead is OAuth2. So a little bit of info on OAuth2. It's a standard. It's defined in an RS RFC. So the uh, Internet Engineering Task Force has taken over management and definition of that standard, and that's where they've published OAuth2. It provides secure authentication, and in particular, it allows us to ensure that your app never sees our user's password. And in the cloud, that's a very important concept, because if you see our user's password, your app can act on behalf of that user. Um, or I in fact, if your app is compromised, our security can be compromised through no fault of ours. So one of the things that OAuth2 does is it ensures that there is never a need for an, a third party app to know the user's password. Instead, there's this idea of token exchange and using tokens to identify who the user is securely. And you'll see that there is still a login. The user still logs in. The difference is they're not logging into your app. They're logging into Alfresco Cloud, and then we grant a token to your app in order, to, uh, in order for you to interact with the APIs. Uh, and as mentioned, we, OAuth also unambiguously identifies the API provider, that's us, the client application, which is your app, and the end user. And that means we can also do things like if an application is behaving or is misbehaving, we can shut off just that one application without affecting the user's account in any other way. We don't change their password. We don't revoke access to any of their other apps. They can continue to use all of those apps. It's just the one misbehaving app that we can shut off. And that's unique to OAuth. Things like HTTP Basic Auth, SSO, NTLM, etc. they don't support that. They don't have this concept of being three-legged, as they call it. So it's a very, very important advantage of OAuth. And it's, it's actually, OAuth's kind of clunky, as we'll see in a minute, but in terms of what it achieves, it's actually really, really good. Um, 
And I should mention, or I mentioned earlier, I think that it is just used to secure the Alfresco cloud. We have no intention yet of adding this into the enterprise product. We're not sure if I will to really make sense within the firewall, behind the firewall. Um, but certainly for cloud, it's a great way to do these things. So question. So the question was, for enterprises where OAuth does make sense, we're not planning, or are we planning on rolling it into the product? Uh, and if so, perhaps when? Um, the answer is we're looking at it. Uh, we think those enterprises are going to be the exception rather than the rule. Um, so certainly the initial focus is on getting API parity between cloud and on-prem. That's a much bigger benefit. OAuth may come later. Th that, that would be a lower priority, though. It's much more important to have the APIs than to have a consistent. Correct. And the number one difference is if we didn't don't offer the same API, that's a serious problem for your app. So, so yeah, the primary goal is let's get API parity, even if authentication is necessarily different between the on-prem product and the, the cloud product. Um, and in the future, maybe we will look at offering OAuth. We think, again, enterprises are probably not going to be interested because th the thing with OAuth you've got to understand is that the end user has to effectively provision the app. We think enterprises aren't going to like that because they just want to they want to dictate the apps that their users use. Hey, you're using Alfresco. Hey, you're using Effisoft for scanning. Hey, you're using, um, I don't know, WeWebU for transactional content management. With jamming this down your throat, you're an employee, you don't get a choice. That model doesn't work so well in the cloud, but for enterprises, it's perfectly appropriate. You're an employee. I'm, I use, um, you know, we use Google internally, Google Apps. I don't necessarily like Google Mail very much, but I use it because I'm an employee. So. But let's move on. Um, the thing with OAuth is it does have a fairly complicated flow, and this is where your application needs to understand, or, or you as a developer need to understand the OAuth flow in order to correctly implement OAuth in your app. And we'll see, actually, during the code demo, we've started work on some libraries that mitigate some of that and make it a little bit easier. Uh, but for now, it, it, it certainly helps to understand the flow even when the library is taking some of the burden off. Question at the back. Yep, so I think the question is, and sorry to cut you short, but I'm just cognizant of time. Um, I'm 15 minutes into a 10-minute prezzo. Um, I think the question, if I could summarize, is are there, is there plans, or does Alfresco have plans around library support for OAuth so that I, as the de application developer, don't have to deal with some of the details of OAuth? The answer is yes, you'll actually be doing that in the coding exercise. So Jared, is Jared in the room? No, I guess not. So Jared Otley is one of our integrations engineers. And this was something he did as sort of a hobby project as we were launching the APIs. And there's a library called Spring Social. So Spring Social is the Spring Foundations or the Spring Frameworks uh, OAuth client library. And they have plugins for different OAuth providers, mostly consumer-oriented, or Twitter, Facebook, um, Google. There's a whole bunch of them. I can't remember all of them. But basically, if you're a cloud provider with an OAuth off protected offering, chances are someone's written a Spring Social plugin for it somewhere. So what Jared did was he wrote an Alfresco OAuth plugin for Spring Social called Spring Social Alfresco, funnily enough. It's on GitHub. You can go and have a look. It's not an Alfresco 
sort of official product that we sell or anything. It's just done as a, you know, Jared did it in a couple of weeks as a hobby project. Um, but we're going to be using that in the, the coding exercise. So you'll see how a library can certainly help with some of the vagaries of OAuth. But even with that said, I think it's really important to understand the flow that OAuth imposes or uses. And that's what comes up next. So let's go through the flow, keeping in mind that the library is going to shield you from some of this. First up, there is a registration step. And the registration step is when you, as a developer, register as, a, as an Alfresco developer and then create application keys. And these are some steps we're going to go through in hopefully in about 10 minutes' time. Um, we're going to sign up for the Alfresco developer portal and we're going to get you some application keys. Um, and in doing so, you will be able to start to develop applications. So this is a one-time deal. It's really important to understand you don't have to do this every single time you want to run your app or anything like that. This is a one-time activity that you do once to register as a developer and then once per app that you wish to offer to the market to get the keys for that app. So really rare. It's very quick to do, very easy. We're not placing any restrictions on how many apps you register. We're not charging for that. Once you're into the portal, it's you know free and quick to register as many applications as you like. Now, in terms of the actual authorization flow, so you've already registered as a developer, you've registered an application, and you've got the keys. Sometime later, some months later, some user has downloaded your app or has uh, accessed it if it's a web app or you know however it's provisioned, and they're attempting to use it for the first time. This is the flow that will occur. Your application needs to link to if it's a web application or show if it's a mobile app or a desktop app in some way a link to the Alfresco authorization page. And that authorization page will receive as, you, as parameters the keys that you had previously retrieved or generated on the developer portal. That link, that authorization page, is actually served by Alfresco. And we will present a little web UI, and you'll see it here shortly. Um, that web UI asks the user to approve your app. And they have a choice. The user can actually deny and say, nope, I don't want this app accessing my cloud account. Um, so you've got to understand there's some error handling needed there in case the user clicks it and then says, actually, that was a mistake. I don't, I don't want to continue. Once the user's approved the app, we redirect back to what's called a callback URL. And that callback URL is in your application. It's, it needs to be something that the browser can, if it's a web app, something that the browser can retrieve. And we pass you a one-time code called an authorization code. That authorization code has a lifetime of 10 minutes. You have 10 minutes to actually convert it into what's called an access token. So this is where we're getting into a lot of OAuth details. But you get the authorization code back. You have 10 minutes to make a subsequent call to Alfresco to convert it into an access token. We also give you a thing called a refresh token. And we'll talk a little bit about what the refresh token is for in a minute. But the access token is really the thing that you will be passing when you make API calls. And let's have a look at that. So when your application is making API calls, hitting REST endpoints, calling CMIS, whatever APIs your app needs, you'll need to pass along that access token. And that's done in the authorization header. So that's a standard part of HTTP. There's an authorization header. And you put bearer, and then you put the access token in that header. And at that point, the API call just succeeds. Based on that value, we know who the user is, we know which application is calling their account, and we can then you know, execute the logic of that API, return data to you, perform mutations on data if that's the API you're calling, et cetera, et cetera. And you can continue doing that as long as that access token remains valid. And by default, for now, and keep in mind this may change as we tune our cloud offering, but in the Alfresco cloud today, the access token has a lifetime of, um, keep me honest here, one hour. So it is valid for one, one hour. And at the end of that hour, no matter how much or how little that access token has been used, it will be invalidated. It will no longer be, be valid for use. It's, it's served its purpose. It's now you know, a junk token. So the question is, well, what happens at the end of the hour? Does my user have to log in again? Do I have to go through that whole thing of bugging the user and getting them to approve my app again? The answer is no. That's actually what the refresh token is for. You'll recall when you converted the authorization code, we gave you two things, an access token 
which you can immediately use for API calls, and a refresh token, which you don't really use for anything yet. You just have to store it somewhere. You have to hold on to that thing. Well, when the access token expires, that's when the refresh token comes into play. And what the refresh token allows you to do is convert or, or, or retrieve a new access token. So the, you've been making API calls happily for an hour. You get back a 401 error, indicating that you're no longer authorized. That access token is no longer valid. And we actually also include in the body of the message and description of what happened. Your application can then use the refresh token to get a new access token, which will be valid for another hour. And you'll notice, and the important point here is, there is no user involvement anywhere in this picture. Neither you as the developer nor the end user as the consumer of the app has any idea that they've gotten a new access token. It's fully automated. That's important because we want to provide the user with the experience of they approve the app once, and they just use it. They use it for a week, they use it for a month, they use it for a year. They don't have to log in or approve your app again. That's a really important point. People get a little confused about this. Now, one thing about refresh tokens is they also have a lifetime. And right now, we've set that lifetime to be seven days. So that refresh token will expire after seven days of inactivity. Another really important point. Each time you use the refresh token to get a new access token, we reset that seven-day clock we basically give you another seven days. So as long as a user is using your app at least once every seven days, they will never have to renew or approve the app again. That's another important point. It's basically they're logged in, they're approved once. Your app will never need to do that again, provided the user uses at least once every seven days. Final point on this very quickly. Um, we, um, we're playing with these numbers. So seven days is the value right now. We may choose to expand that and make that a month. We're just taking it cautiously. As long as your app knows it has to handle a refresh flow, you're not going to really notice when that, those values change. It's more of an operational issue for us as to how often we want to have to go through the refresh flows. So it's an important point. Question? Well, remember, this is cloud, so there is just one cloud. There is the Alfresco cloud. It's a single cl Alfresco cluster, and these values are for the entire API set in that Alfresco instance, that, the Alfresco cloud. No, it's not per application. It is global. So the seven-day limit applies no matter which application it is. Of obviously, every single refresh token has a different timer associated with it. It's tied to the app and the user. The refresh token is specific to the app and the user. Yep. No, and we would never, I don't think, I don't, my, my gut feel is we would never give that, that control to you because that opens us up for malicious uh, use of, of those timing. I mean, someone could come in and say, I want my refresh tokens, I want my access tokens to be valid for 100 years. We don't want that. We don't want the security risk of, I understand the refresh token has the same security risk as the access token though because you can always convert a refresh token into an access token. So effectively they're one and the same thing. Um, so we're playing it cautiously. We would, my gut feel is we would never give that into your hands to control. Will the number change from seven days? Quite possibly. And that could happen quite quickly. We, we were playing around, I think, when we are in, in our staging environment, I think it's a day, if, if memory serves, for the refresh token. Uh, we may expand from seven days to a month for the refresh token in production. We could do that in the next you know, couple of weeks. I'd, I don't know. We, we, we're playing with that, we're, we're being cautious with those numbers. but. I think the key thing for you to all take away is it will change. You need to code the refresh flow properly, and provided you've coded the refresh flow properly, when we change that value, you're not going to know. It's not going to matter. Question? Correct. 
Absolutely. In fact, that's something Gethin has been playing with quite a bit. And I think you're sort of an advocate of that model is, is um, putting a timer on it and actually tracking and proactively getting a new access token without even attempting, instead of attempting this call here, you actually do this proactively. And that's absolutely allowed. You can do that. Correct. Yep. Yep. Just grab a new access token. And as long as you do that once every seven day period, that user will never see the authorization page again. Question at the back. So the question was, So the question was, uh, given a token, do I know who the user is? And I'm sorry I'm not repeating all of the questions. I need to do that for the recording. But um, uh, the answer is, right now, there is a way. It's a little bit more convoluted than we'd like. We've actually added a, there's a JIRA right now for a, what, what I'm calling a Who Am I API. So effectively, that's an API. It's unrelated to the token. But you would call a server, and the server would just respond with, say, the, the user ID. In the case of cloud, that's an email address. Yep. Uh, you can drop the tokens, drop the access token, drop the refresh token on your end in your app, and at that point, you no longer have any knowledge about that user. On our end, we can do the same thing. And in fact, it's, that's an important thing that OAuth provides is, and it's not there yet, but we have some work going on to add a, an app management section to the Alfresco Cloud UI so that a user can go in and see, oh, look, I approved all of these apps. That one's dodgy or I don't want it anymore, revoke. And at that point, when your app attempts to use either the access token or the refresh token, you'll get errors because the user has revoked your app. And the best thing you can do is ask them to re-allow and they may say, no, I don't want that app using my account. So yeah, absolutely, you can, you can revoke on either end. In fact, our Google Docs integration, those of you who saw this morning's announcement, our Google Docs integration is an OAuth client of Google Docs. And we actually do some of that. We actually drop the tokens in some cases. And there are some cases where that's useful. Yeah. Um, so the full flow, of course, is once you've got a new access token, you start executing API calls again. Very simple. You attempt an API call. You get a security unauthorized error 401. Use the refresh token to get a new access token. Start using the OAuth token again. And with that, let's move on to the developer portal. So all of you who have laptops out, um, let me switch over now to my browser. Oops. Uh, what, and I'm a, I apologize for not having a larger screen, but the, the URL you want to go to is developer.alfresco.com. And what we're going to do is hit this register as a developer link up the top. Now, I'm already registered, so I'm not going to be able to complete this wizard, but I can show you the steps that are necessary. So if you remember back to the first of the OAuth diagrams, we're the little guy with the hat, and we're currently registering as an Alfresco developer. So let's do that. And please follow along. This is the first of we're sort of setting up, ready to, to do some coding. Yeah, you can see mine's already in use. Um, the terms and conditions, um, I'll talk about very briefly. Um, and by the way, once you've completed this wizard, you can click register now. We're not going to get started on an application just yet. I'll show you how to do that separately in a minute. Um, the terms and conditions, I would encourage you to read them. I know they're a pain, but it's, it's worth reading them if you get a chance. To summarize, and this is from a non-lawyer, non um, to summarize, the terms and conditions lay out three basic things. Alfresco's intellectual property is Alfresco's. Your intellectual property, your application logic, is yours. And the end user's content is theirs. And by accepting the terms and conditions, basically what you're doing is you're pretty much agreeing that you will abide by those terms. These are the same terms and conditions that we actually have for cloud usage, obviously without the application intellectual property bit. That's what's new here. Um, but unlike many other cloud-hosted content management systems, 
we place, we, we have no right to the end user's content. We place, we have no claim to their content. Their content is theirs, It'll, it's always theirs. That's a very important guarantee for us to provide to our customers. You guys as application developers, as people who are gonna be having logic act on a user's behalf, need to make sure that your applications also adhere to those, to that terms and conditions. So that's the non-lawyer summary of those terms and conditions. Um, you can see there's a URL there which is a bit easier to read if you wanna go and have a look. Um, so everybody signed up? I'm gonna cancel this because I can't actually sign up, but I will log in now. Oops, it would help if I could remember my password. There we go, that's where it's saved. So when you log in to the developer portal, you will see uh, this dashboard. Um, pretty simple, we haven't done a, spent a lot of time sort of revving this yet, although we will. Um, the main thing that is of interest as an application developer is this applications tab. So when you click the applications tab, you get a list of your applications. And these, this is where you register applications. So let's go through that process. What we want to do is add an application. We give it a name. I should mention this application name is shown to the end user. This is the name that is displayed when the end user uh, allows or approves your application to access their account. So good idea to try to make this somewhat descriptive. No, you could do that too, but your user, the user may very well say, that doesn't sound very good, I'm gonna deny that app. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're free to do whatever you want. Probably, you know, I may start doing scanning for profanity, that kind of thing. We, we need to just kind of lock some of those processes down, but um, Keep in mind, the end user is gonna see that, so you probably wanna do something that is enticing to the end user, not discouraging. Um, we're collecting some metadata about platforms. Again, the user won't see this. This is more for my use. And the primary thing I'm interested in is finding out which technologies people are developing in for now, because that will help guide our investment into things like SDKs. If we find that a lot of people are doing stuff in, say, COBOL, maybe I'll look at writing a CMIS COBOL client, or, or contributing one to Apache chemistry. So this is more for my benefit. I'd love it if you could be honest about this. Um, and if you are using COBOL, which I don't think is on the list, no, it's not, um, put it in the description, because that means I can go and have a look and see what it is. You know, you might put in a comment, please add a COBOL CMIS client. Moving along to the next step. We only have a single API, which is just the API. Um, the tool we're using actually allows us to have multiple API sets. We may make use of that in the future, but for now we have a single API. You need to accept the terms and conditions again. That's something we're hoping to fix, but for now it's there. And then finally, you enter your callback URL. Now, uh, this needs to match exactly what your application is going to use as its callback URL. So I'm going to, in fact, if you look at the zip file that was going around, there's a readme file, a readme.md. Uh, it's a markdown file. The callback URL that we'll be using in the coding exercise is listed in that readme file. I would strongly encourage you to copy and paste that to make sure you get it exactly right. Because even one character being wrong, you know, in wrong case, some white space, will prevent the OAuth flow from working. So it's very important to get that right. I'm gonna leave it blank for now just so I'm not flipping around between the zip file. Um, and at that point, basically, you're done. I'm just going to put in. You can see I have my DevCon app. And here's my API key. In fact, if we go in and edit, we can get the API key and the secret. Thank you. If you come now into this app and click on the auth tab, you'll see there's a key. This is the OAuth application key, or client ID it's sometimes referred to, and there's a secret. And we need both of these in order to initiate the OAuth flow. So um, Gethin's about to uh, start on the actual coding exercise. What I would suggest though is that you leave this page open because we're gonna need to copy and paste these values into your own app uh, here in a minute. So leave this open and we'll flip over to the 
coding exercise. So over to you, Gavin. And I'm going to be floating around. If you have any questions, um, you know, or any, if you're running into issues or can't find the files we're referring to, um, just put your hand up and I'll come around and give you a hand. So on the USB, there's uh, some sample files. It's a sample application we're going to use. We're going to use Java today. Um, it's using Spring Social Alfresco, as you mentioned. Jared, who was in the room, has just left, I think, wrote it. Um, it includes um, the CMIS client, so it's client libraries in Java for the APIs. Um, there are other client libraries. I particularly recommend the mobile SDKs if you're going to do mobile. Um, there's already available for um, iOS and Android, and they'll take a lot of the pain out of uh, the OAuth work and also calling the APIs. So I'd recommend those if you're doing mobile. Um, so we're really worried about the, the internet connection here. We weren't sure how it's going to go. So I've got a zip file there that's got all the dependencies in. It's kind of a self-contained zip file, which I'm going to use. Just try and make it easier, try and um, make sure the network's not in too much trouble. So I'm just going to extract this zip file a minute. Um, basically, the zip file's got its self-contained. This particular version is using a thing called the Gradle wrapper, which is um, it just the only the only requirement is a Java virtual machine. It just it's self-contained. Um, there's also a Maven version there for the Maven people. Um, we were just a bit concerned about the internet connection here, so we've got, we've zipped this all up into one distribution. Um, and because we're using uh, this sort of self-contained distribution, we have to do a little bit of config to get it working. Um, so the first thing I'm basically going to do what the readme says is I just open some text editor. We just need to tell the Gradle wrapper where the distribution files are. So I'm in Gradle wrapper, Gradle wrapper properties. You just need to put your distribution URL in there, which is an uh, absolute path to your um, distribution directory. So for Windows users, there's a value there. I'm just going to do... I'll show you what I'm going to do. So my code is in, well, very long path. And if you use this at home, you won't have to do this step. Or, you know, if you lose it later on, it's just, just for the network connection. So that's just a, it's an absolute path to the root folder where you extracted that zip file, and then distribution slash grid. And then if you've got a working Java virtual machine on Windows, you just type Gradle W, um, Linux dot slash Gradle W. Um, and hopefully that should uh, unpack the distribution for you. And you should see build successful. we can move the projector a little bit. You can move the projector a little bit just so we can uh, see the edge of the screen. Just slightly. Can you see on that? It's a little bit off. That's right. That's okay, I think. Lots of people can see. Has anybody got that far? Yeah. Sure. Um, I'm actually not going to do many commands in this, but um, uh, I'll leave it. But there's not there's not going to be many commands. So Gradle W is the one you want to start off with. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. So the second thing you want to do is, is to enter your API key in secret that we just talked about on the developer portal. So, oops. 
I'm just going to register an app. Callback URL is really important. Um, I have it in the config file. This is basically a path to the local server that we've got running. We're going to have a little embedded Jetty server running locally um, just to, to go through the OAuth flow. Um, so this is a key part um, to use. I think the readme file mentions this, but I'll go through this again. I'm also going to use Eclipse. So for Eclipse, I'm going to type Gradle W space Eclipse. It's just going to generate the Eclipse config files. Similarly for Maven users, you do MVN Eclipse, colon Eclipse. I'm going to get to a point, and I'm going to stop, and I'm going to go through it with you, check how you're getting on. So I'll just do one more config. And then, yeah. Yeah. It's in both places. So as part of the OAuth flow, you have to pass the callback URL in. You'll see shortly um, the OAuth 2 spec requires you to pass in the callback URL. And it, it compares what you've registered in the developer portal versus what you're actually sending in. So it's one of those kind of security features. So I'm just going to import my project into Eclipse. So I type Gradle W Eclipse to generate Eclipse files, and I've just imported it into Eclipse for you to use. And we're just going to go through this one config file, then we're going to have a short break for me talking to see how you're getting on. So there's a config file in source main resources called config.properties, and this is where we're going to enter the um, information that you entered in the developer portal. So I haven't even saved this yet, so I need to save this. Okay, so there's my client key. So I'm going to take that client key and put it in here. And my secret. Well done. And put it in here. So these are the three key bits of information you need. Client ID, client secret, and the redirect URI. The key comes from the uh, developer portal here, secrets here. Callback URL has to match exactly what you're going to pass in. Right, I'll just save that. And if that works, I'll be doing Gradle W Jetty run. This is in the README file. So Gradle W is always the command for Windows users or dot slash Gradle W space jetty run or maven users that would be mvn space jetty colon run and hopefully you'll see something like that running at localhost 8090 alpha api which is right at the bottom i don't really see it Hopefully you should see something like that. So I'm going to pause and walk around a minute to see how you're getting on. Um, if you see this screen, you're, you're doing quite well. If you see the Alfresco logo, that means you're talking to the internet. Um, so we're just going to have a quick look. And you can always click on the first link. That's a bit, that's better. If you see that, you're doing really well. Um, do you want to allow DevCon app? DevCon app is the name of the application that I um, entered in the portal. And this is what the user's going to see. So this would be what the user sees when they enter their credentials. We've talked about the OAuth flow. 
This is the, the first authorization that is presented to the user. So I'm just going to see how you're all getting on in a minute. Raise your hand if you need some help. That one. How many people have got as far as here? Good, some, yeah? Nice. <laughs> okay, so this is the um, Alfresco auth prompt that the user will see for your application. Um, so any user that logs in, they need to have a cloud account. This is the um, authorization that they grant into your application. So um, I'm going to go through the code in the app, the sample app now in a minute. But, um, essentially, it's going to slash authorize. You can see the, user, user, the URL there. It's going to aprfresco.com slash authorize. Yeah. So this is hosted on the internet. This is our standard authorized page. If I enter my cloud credentials. take a couple of minutes, it's going to do a few calls. That's good. If you see that, you're doing really well. Now I'm going to take you through some of the code to show you what's going on. Essentially, I've tried to make this app as simple as I could, which was servlets, JSPs, which is a bit shocked to me because I haven't written servlets for a little while on their own. Um, but basically, I've just got um, a servlet Here, which is the is done start, so that would have been um, I've, I've gone past it now. Basically, I've got a um, kind of a bootstrap method here, init method. Uh, I not necessarily recommend that you do this in a servlet init, but your application is going to have to have some sort of startup init type functionality. And for this example, all I've done is I've got this config file. Um, which is the, the one that you've been changing to enter your client credentials. And I just bootstrap that up. And I get the authorization URL and the redirect URL. Now, these actually come from Spring Social Alfresco. It's actually um, working out what they are. So we're using this wrapper on top of the API. You can, of course, use the API how you want. But we provide client uh, SDKs and client wrappers for this to, um, to save you some of the pain, hopefully. So. Basically, all I'm doing is initializing those variables and then calling, uh, setting them in the server context. The actual do get on this just redirects straight to the authorization URL, which is what, what you were saying. Basically, all this does is calls the slash authorize page on the internet. And once you call the slash authorize page, it's going to go to your callback. That callback URL is the one we've, we've entered. We've cut and pasted it because it has to be exactly right. Uh, and that will hit this callback servlet. So the, f the thing to notice about this, the very first line, it gets the request parameter called code. So what has happened in this, when you're calling this, when this code is run, the user has authorized the application using that dialog. They pressed allow. And the part of the auth OAuth flow callback URL has been called and the request parameter is set with an authorization code. 
That is the first part of the flow that uh, Peter was describing earlier. It's also got a scope which we don't really use. It is used in OAuth, but we don't use it very much. Not, it's it's hard-coded. You'll see in the developer portal it's hard-coded to public API. So once you get the authorization code, as Peter was explaining in the flow before, you need to then get this access code, and the access code is kind of the thing that you really need. And this line here basically does that. So what that's going to do, it's going to automatically go off and call Alfresco again and say, here's my authorization code, give me an access code. You can see the log message here. It says receive an access token. Um, if I look for a log, I should put a log in here somewhere. There we go. That's my that's my access token. This is the this is the most important thing you need. That's what you need to call every time you call the API. You need that access token. Um, this client library will do that for you. So don't you don't need to remember that, but um, it's there in the logs if you want to look at it. So going back to this code. So you get the access token, this access grant object in Spring Social, and you can do with it what you want. In this particular example, I'm setting it in the HTTP session because it's a, just a basic app. You could store it in your own data store. It depends how you want to architect your application. I'm not going to tell you how to architect your application. I'm just suggesting, trying to explain the flow to you. and. Um, and show you how to call the API. This is all the initial OAuth dance. Fairly soon we can start using the API. I appreciate that OAuth is rather complicated. I'm trying to simplify it as much as possible, but it is a bit convoluted. So the callback URL comes in. It sets this access grant in the session, and I'm, I'm doing another redirect to a use connection servlet here. This is, you, can, you don't have to do redirects, you can do what you want. I'm just setting up some data, some basic data um, using the, the access token. And the bit to notice, if you're familiar with Spring Social, this is how you create a Spring Social connection. So this is a Java object which um, takes the access grant and creates you an Alfresco Spring Social class. And this is Alfresco Spring Social class is the one that's got all the important things on it. Hold on. Seems to be lacking the outline. Yeah. There it is. So this particular Alfresco part uh, object deals with all the specific API calls to Alfresco, so not CMIS. You're going to see the CMIS calls in a minute, but this is the extra things that we've added. So things like get it, getting sites, getting preferences, getting networks. These URLs are all available for you to call when any, any language you want. I'd point you to the um, very useful documentation straight off the developer um, portal, which details the Alfresco API. You probably can't see this very well. Um, I'll let you get it. It's, um, let me go to that. Yeah, API reference there. If you get that PDF, you can see all the different URLs, different parameters you can call. That would be HTTP uh, calls. Um, it's up to you how you want to do that. We're using the Spring Social <coughs> Library, but you can do it how you want. So essentially, now we've, we can get into actually writing some code. We've done all the dance. We've done all that complicated work. Now we can actually start calling the API. And here we've got get home networks. Uh, somebody was asking about how do you know who, um, who the current user is or know about the, the user. Um, you can call get current user will turn you the person object, which tells you the person details. Find out their home network. And you can also get a, a seamless session. For this particular example, I'm putting those in the HTTP session to use in other pages so we can play around with it. Um, 
but you can again do what you, you want with it. So again, I'm redirecting to a JSP. And my JSP just uses those. Basically just gets those out of the HTTP session, so person.firstname, person.email. And that's what you can see here, person.email, person and CMS root network. How are we getting on with that? Yeah, people, see, has anybody seen this page? Good. My dot fresco dot com. You can sign up there. Okay. Now, basically, you've got all the tools you need to call the API. I'm going to give you some examples. How long have we got here? So I'm going to give you some examples. Do something great is a servlet, which I've set up especially for you to use. If you want to write a servlet, there's a do something servlet, which is ready for you to use. So you can write your code. You can call, do your API calls there. Um, Obviously, it's the server. You're going to have to stop and start your server if you make changes. I've also got Groovy in here to make it a little bit quicker for this demo. So I've got the equivalent of do something server called do something Groovy here, which is essentially the same code. Just gets the gets the information out and uses it. So do something Groovy. There we go. That's calling that Groovy page. So you can write in Java or Groovy, call the API, explore the API, do what you want. Um, these objects, the, the two kind of key objects is this Alfresco object, which I showed you. This is a CMIS session. So those familiar with CMIS, CMIS. We pretty, that'll be pretty familiar to some people. So you can create folder, create document. Also, actually, this example includes Alfresco extensions to CMS as well. Yeah, it's just on the screen.
Okay, while um, Peter was talking, I was just setting myself up just a sample Groovy file so I could show you some more demos. How long have we got left? How long have we got left? Half an hour. Oh, good. So, now we've got the code, you can do what you want with it, to be honest. Hopefully, if you've got to this stage, you can, you can write your own apps. Um, I'm just going to start going through one. Um, there's actually hidden, well, not hidden. Here, I've got a notes.txt, which has actually got my code in that I'm going to use um, to do <coughs> various activities. Um, there's actually some more samples on, so the source code for this is on the USB, but also it's available on GitHub. I think it's in the presentation where it is. And in the DevCon branch, we've got some samples of some of the things you can do, so creating folders, searching, getting children, getting relationships. Um, these are in Groovy, I think. Yeah, so that's CMIS select, select. So you're welcome to have a little go at those. So I'm going to, I've got a site here already, so you, if you're familiar with the cloud, uh, this is my.alfresco.com, I just created my own public API trial site, I've got a folder called DevCon. So I'm going to create a folder, uh, upload a photo, depend on time, maybe tag it, comment on, on it, see how it goes. So there's a problem this morning with the login. So, so clear your browser cache if you have any problems logging into cloud. So to get my folder, I'm going to do see session dot get. Oops, see me session dot get object by path. So, the path to the folder is going to be the site name, document library, and then the folder is called DevCon, so it's going to be like that. So this is um, standard CMIS slash sites slash public API trial site in my my case, which is my name of my site, document library, and then I happen to have a folder in there called DevCon. Um, and then hopefully, so in Groovy, you can just do parent folder dot ID. So, So that's just getting a reference to the parent folder ID, CMIS. And then you can do what you want with it. I've got this folder object. You can also cast this to an Alfresco folder object, which actually I'm not sure what the benefit of an Alfresco folder object is. Uh, uh, as aspect support, I suppose, is one of the things that our extensions use for, but uh, not so important there. Um, so let's create a folder. So to create a folder, you have to pass in a map of properties. Uh, that's the type and name. I happen to have done those already. So I'm going to call the folder my photos, and it's of type folder. These are actually constants you can use from CMIS, but um, I'm just popping them in there. So I think that returns a folder. <coughs> so 
So let's see if this works. Uh, is that everything? Yeah, so you can see that I've created a folder. The second one is a, a folder. Um, and I can go on and on. I mean, I'm not sure how long I've got actually. I'm not sure. So we've got like, how long have we got left? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll switch back to the slides and we can take questions. And then I can, if there's time at the end, I can show you some more things. But basically, it's just calling the API. There's more samples in that notes.txt of getting children, uploading a photo. But basically, if you're at this stage, then you've got the tools you need to write your own applications, basically. I'll flip back to you. Okay, so those of you who stuck with that will probably have noticed that where we where Gethin left us is basically in CMIS development land. And those of you who have already used CMIS with our Fresco on premise will probably have started noticing some familiarity and some things that you're already doing in terms of finding folders, creating objects, setting metadata property maps, that kind of thing. Um, that was actually a key part of this exercise was to try to show you that really the OAuth piece is the only bit that's new in the Alfresco Cloud API. Uh, and once you're into the API world, you're really just doing pretty much standard Seamus plus the REST API pieces. Um, some of the examples that Gethin showed in that notes.txt that sort of go beyond where he got to also show some of the REST API, the Alfresco API calls. So things like commenting on the photo. Uh, did we do tagging? I can't remember if there's a tagging example. So Gethin's pointed out there are any examples on the GitHub page. So if you go to the GitHub page for that project, you can actually get more examples that show different ways of calling the APIs. But if you're using Spring Social Alfresco, it's actually very easy. It's just the OAuth flow, and then you've got a Java library that you can use to interact. And you know, as Gethin demonstrated, creating a folder is as easy as calling the right API and then logging into your cloud account and seeing that the folder is, in fact, there. Um, the next thing I wanted to mention was where to get help, further help. Uh, of course, Gethin and I are both here for the rest of the week. And you can ply us with fine beer if uh, you want questions answered. We only accept the best. That's why there's a whole stack of PBRs up there. Um, there's also some resources. So we have an API forum now on the Alfresco forum side. We also have a, an IRC chat, and I know that's been getting an increasing amount of uh, use from our community members, and I encourage all of you to jump on there as well. Um, I uh, I've sort of tend to float on and off that IRC channel, but our community guys, Richard Esplin and Jeff Potts, are on there a lot. And usually what happens is if, if there's an interesting API discussion happening, they'll ping me on Skype and say, hey, you should be on IRC. There's some interesting stuff going on. So we will quickly jump on. And of course, Gethin and I are in quite different time zones. So there's usually someone around at some point of the day or night to answer questions about um, API usage, et cetera. And then we also have started a mailing list or a, a Google group, which is our, called our Fresco Technical Discussions. And that's on the Google group. By the way, these are all hyperlinks. So when you get the, the PowerPoint at the end of uh, the, the session, if you download it, you can click on each of these to find these things. Um, but the technical discussion is another good way to get it. And the advantage it has over IRC is that the history is preserved. So you can go and search for previous discussions on, on various topics. Um, I should mention, those aren't limited just to these APIs. The, co the technical conversation is, sorry, the technical discussion Google group has had all sorts of things from architecture and admin through to development with the Java API and so on and so forth. Uh, and then there's source code. So there's code from this session, which Gethin was mentioning is on GitHub. Um, there's the source code for the Spring Social Alfresco library itself. As I mentioned at the start, Jared's been doing that pretty much as a hobby project. It's not officially one of his engineering tasks. And we would love to have contributors join him. I think if you were to approach him after this session, he would love to you know, get your commit rights or you know, talk about pull requests or whatever development process he's uh, looking to, to follow for that project. I actually wrote an example using Spring Social uh, Alfresco in Grails. Um, so there's, you can have a look at a web app that's written using Grails, the, the groovy Rails-like uh, application or web app development framework. 
Jeff Potts has written some Java examples as well that we used at Java 1 and some Python examples as well, just to show that because this is seamless, because it's REST, this is really platform agnostic. If you happen to be a Pythonista, you can you know, use that technology just as easily as Java, Groovy, etc. There is also a book that will shortly be coming out. And again, Jeff is one of the co-authors of that, along with Florian Muller and Jay Brown. Uh, Florian is at SAP. He's on the CMIS committee. And Jay, actually, um, Greg, you may know Jay. Do you know? He's at? He's on the FileNet team. Yeah, so there's a great book coming out about CMIS and the Apache Chemistry Project, which is really a collaboration between SAP, FileNet, and, um, and Alfresco, our very own Jeff Potts. Uh, it talks about CMIS 1.0 and the upcoming 1.1 release. That's just finished public draft and should be out anywhere between six months and a year. It's a little bit hard to predict, um, but it is fairly well progressed. It has lots of Groovy and Java examples, but it also covers other things, Objective-C, Android, Java, and of course, uh, Python. And that's in early access from Manning. And that code that you see there will give you 37% off if you want to buy the early access uh, version. Uh, and that's a great program. I actually do a lot of early access books because you get them cheap and you get them a chapter at a time and then when the book comes out you get the whole thing as the final version as well. Uh, and then in terms of future direction, um, what we have planned really is rolling out more APIs. In particular, CMIS 1.1 is looming very large. Now that it's out of well, now that the public comment period is finished, it's basically being baked, it's, it's getting finalized. We need to get ahead of that curve and make sure that we have the first implementation to market as we did with 1.0. Um, and I'd like to see that appear first in cloud because we are right now the only cloud vendor that offers a CMIS API. Uh, and I think that's quite an exciting story. So I'd love for us to be, you know, the day that that spec is ratified, boom, it's there in production cloud and you can start using the new 1.1 facilities. We also have a bunch of REST APIs we'd like to add. So in addition to pursuing the CMIS path, we also want to continue growing out our Alfresco specific API set as REST APIs. And that's things like user provisioning, transformation, workflow, uh, records management, and potentially rich media management. There may be some things in there that we can do. I should mention this list is not prioritized. So some of these things may happen sooner or later. Um, but certainly there's a lot of areas where um, you know, we can and should and will provide additional APIs. I should also mention that the mobile app um, that, that Gav's team develops, the iOS and Android apps, are both now using this API. The SDKs, there's an SDK, a mobile SDK we offer as well, is effectively a client library for iOS and Android that also uses these APIs. So they're also driving a lot of the requirements. Um, I think we have a plan to add user provisioning, for example, being able to invite users to sites from your mobile device. In order for the mobile team to implement that, they need a public API to do it. We don't want that to be some secret magical source that our mobile app does. We want that to be a public API so that if your apps need to do the same thing, you can do it too. So it's very much an API first approach and the mobile app is a wonderful driver of requirements around that. Now, one thing about APIs is I'm a pretty firm believer sort of philo philosophically, and those of you who were in the partner session yesterday would have heard me talk about this a lot more or in a lot more detail. I'm a big believer that APIs are really just the lowest common denominator. There's actually a lot of value in offering things that aren't APIs, that go beyond APIs as well. Um, we already offer that with our on-premise product. We have things like the share usability extension mechanism. We have content models, workflow definitions, permission definitions, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on. There is no reason that we shouldn't offer those to cloud extension developers as well as on-premise extension developers. So on my list of things that I'd like to see us or that I'm hoping we can start working on soon, it includes things like more client SDKs, Content models, workflow definitions, rule definitions, UI extensions. Um, and the top item is really more of a timing one, but we want this to, we want all of these things to exist on both the cloud product and the on premise products, the community and enterprise editions, so that you can write an app once and deploy it however you wish. It shouldn't be a technical decision, it should be a business decision on your part as to which editions of Alfresco you wish to target. 
And for that, we need to offer you one developer story. So that's very much my goal. The APIs that you've seen to date, by the way, what we're calling V1 of the public APIs, the ones we launched at Java 1 in September, we're hoping, I've sort of got my fingers crossed, and I'm speculating a little bit here, but we're hoping to get that into Enterprise 4.2, which is due out in spring. So we've already done the work. You've already started using the APIs. We need to just get that merged across into that Enterprise release vehicle. And at that point, we have a basic form of API parity between the two different, if you will, editions of the product. And of course, there's the usual disclaimer. It's not committed yet. Please don't build any apps relying on the fact that we're going to have this in enterprise tomorrow. That may or may not happen. We'd all love it to happen, but I don't want to sort of get too far ahead of the curve and, you know, perhaps spoil your plans as a result. So that's a little bit of, little bit of the future, and I think um, we're now ready to take questions, if anybody has any questions. No questions at all? Question at the front. just so it's on the recording. <laughs> Unless you want me to answer the question. You can answer, you can answer it. <laughs> so the question was, can we get the browser binding, and by browser binding I assume you mean the CMIS 1.1 browser binding, into the cloud APIs soon? Um, and the answer really that I gave you yesterday I think is the answer. Um, 1 1, CMIS 1.1 1 .1 is not yet ratified. It's not yet a spec. It's a proposed spec. Um, some of the things in it we get for free because we use Apache chemistry on the server side for our implementation. The browser binding happens to be one of those things. Chemistry actually deals with the, if you will, serialization of data across the wire, Atom, Pub, Soap, and now browser in 1.1. 1 .1. It handles that. So we could just upgrade our libraries theoretically and get the browser binding for free. 1.1 1 .1 has a lot of other valuable features, though, that we also need to roll in, and a lot of those features do need us to do engineering work. So it's things like type mutation. In 1.1, 1 .1 you can modify types. 1.1 uh, 1 .1 adds support for what they call secondary types, which we call aspects. Those of you who know Alfresco terminology will know about aspects and types. Um, CMAS 1.1 1 .1 actually adds support for aspects, which is great. We won't have to kludge around it the way we've had, we've had to do in 1.0. There is a possibility that we could put it up as an unsupported sort of preliminary binding initially. Um, that needs more thought in a nutshell. I'd love to be able to give you a concrete answer, but... For the browser binding. Yeah, and we, c we can certainly look at that. Keep in mind the Cloud API story is brand new. It's only a month and a half old, so we're taking baby steps right now. Um, and I don't want to downplay it because I think it's an excellent idea and it's something I would love to be able to just click my fingers and have happen. Um, but we just need to do our due diligence. It, but it's, it's, a great, it's a great bit of feedback and something that certainly, you know, if there's a lot of demand for it, um, and it sounds like there's at least two in the room who would love to hear it, I think the biggest story is the HTML5 story, which may or may not be mobile. That's actually the story, because right now CMIS is almost unconsumable within a browser-based app. The browser binding is certainly the, and the committee recognized this, which is why the browser binding was an important part of 1.1. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we, I, I mean, it's great feedback, and I just... Yeah, I did at the start of the session, yep. But to reiterate what I said for anyone who's joined, um, Gavin's doing a bunch of sessions on the mobile SDK or a couple of sessions on the mobile SDKs. Uh, I think others are talking about it too, probably the mobile app versus the SDK. So just the two SDK talks. Yeah, so those are good ones to talk if you're interested in mobile specifically. 
And mobile right now, by the way, is using the atom pump binding. So it is parsing XML. Yeah, but it's a native app, so it can do that quite easily. Yeah. I'll count that as three votes then. I heard three votes for the browser binding being, but I, I guess the, the one thing is we wouldn't necessarily want to get too ahead of the 1-1 one, one ratification because we could, if the committee changes their mind about the spec, we leave ourselves in a difficult situation. So, yeah. Um, any other questions? Okay, great. Well, Geth and I are going to be around for the rest of the week, so please come and grab us if you have any more questions or if you want to work more on the app. Um, but other than that, thank you very much. <laughs>